I'm Matt McClure and this is Currents. January 12, 2010 at 4.53 p.m. A deadly earthquake rocked the island nation of Haiti. Haitians around the world, they will always remember that. In the end, more than 200,000 people lost their lives, and for those who survived, life changed forever. They come into open-air camps, but the tents are very inadequate for human living. Tonight, on a special edition of Currents, Haiti, one year later, from rubble to rebuilding. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. Just over one year ago, a devastating earthquake struck Haiti. This week, the world paused to remember that tragic day and look forward to change and rebuilding. The earthquake not only took the lives of Haitians, but the livelihoods of those who survived. Homes, schools, and churches crumbled to the ground. The Diocese of Brooklyn, home to thousands of Haitians, quickly lent a helping hand, including a special program that allowed Haitian-American priests to return to Haiti and to help rebuild their homeland. We recently spoke to two of the priests who, uh, of the Diocese of Brooklyn for whom the earthquake truly hit home. Bishop Guy Sanseri, the first Haitian American bishop and head of the National Center of the Haitian Apostolate, and Father Donaldson Tevnier. He's the coordinator of the Diocese, Diocesan Haitian Apostolate here in Brooklyn and Queens. And they gave us a picture of Haiti then and now. The earthquake which strike Haiti um, has changed the mind of each and everyone. And Haitians around the world, they will always remember that. They're no longer the same. There has been unprecedented help from uh, foreign countries, but the most of the rebels are still on the ground. You come upon thousands of people who lost their homes and everything in it and frequently they are close relatives. And therefore, they come into open air camps, but the tents are very, very, very inadequate for human living. When it rains, water goes into these tents, and that can create other problems, that can create um, diseases. There have been some efforts at uh, building uh, temporary wooden houses but you have first to negotiate to find where. The communal response of the world showed exactly that there is a God. We see these good things, we need more. The government has always been weak. Occasionally we have brilliant uh, presidents, but more frequently we had tyrants or dictators who really are kind of blocks the progress of the country. When there is a lack in the presence of the government, then automatically chaos began to function. The cholera broke out uh, at least six or seven months after the earthquake and doesn't seem to be the result of the earthquake. We could have expected this to take place following the earthquake. It didn't happen. Why it happened two months ago? And because of that, Haiti has seen too much. The church is still strong, but has been very hard hit, because more than 50 churches have been totally destroyed, including the cathedral of Port-au-Prince. People are affected by the earthquake. They do their own thing to maintain their faith. The presence of the Catholic Church in Port-au-Prince was missing. When there is no foundation, what can the just man do? Uh, so you need foundations. Your faith tells you, keep going. You are almost there. Your faith tells you, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Today, the message to the Haitian people must be a message of hope. Isaiah the prophet prophesied that there will be a remnant of the people and God will answer them. There will be a remnant as well of the Haitian people. Hope involves labor, energy. We hope 
to energize the Haitian people so that they take their destiny into their hands. And we believe it's possible. It's going to be difficult, but it is possible. We'll hear more from Bishop Sansarik later on in the show, but stay tuned. When we come back, we'll have the day's headlines, including historic news from the Vatican about Pope John Paul II. But first, as the one-year anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti approached, we visited St. Jerome's Church in the heart of Brooklyn's Haitian community to hear their prayers and hopes for Haiti. And we'll hear what they had to say throughout tonight's show. Saddened that uh, more hasn't been done or the situation hasn't been improved. Non seulement les douloureux, mais les cicatrices là encore là. We hoping and praying nothing like that repeat itself because it's unbearable. C'est vraiment dur pour les Haïtiens. Là nous fin songer tout ça qui s'est passé quand c'était Haïtiens qui mourit et gens qui mourent cruellement et il y a les innocents qui sont morts aussi parmi les enfin des, des coupables. Moi personnellement, j'ai gagné une nièce moi qui était mort dans le tremblement de terre là. À présent nous beaucoup gens me connaît qui va aussi rejoindre, si on va joindre. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, New York remembered the victims of the Haiti earthquake at a few memorials around the city. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, the guessing game is now over. Vatican watchers have been looking forward to Pope John Paul II's beatification as a key step towards sainthood. And now we know when it is going to happen. We get more details from Rome Reports. It has finally been confirmed. The beatification of John Paul II will be on May 1st. Il Santo Padre ha approved. The Pope has approved for the beatification to take place on May 1st of this year, on the Sunday of Divine Mercy, an important date in his life and his encounter with the Lord. The Vatican spokesman Federico Lombardi has also stated that the body of John Paul II will be transferred to the chapel of St. Sebastian under the Basilica of St. Peter's, which will most likely happen before the beatification. A day has still not been assigned for the liturgical celebration. Well, earlier this week, the Vatican certified the miraculous healing of a French nun from Parkinson's disease after she prayed to the late pontiff soon after his death. Certification of a second miracle is required for sainthood. From England, three former Anglican bishops were ordained deacons for the Catholic Church. The three men will be founding members of the English and Welsh Ordinariate. That's the church body for other Anglicans wishing to convert to Catholicism. The three men won't be deacons for long. In an accelerated process approved by the Vatican, they'll be ordained to the priesthood tomorrow. More news from the Vatican on another historic move in another part of the world. We get details on that story from Rome Reports. The Pope has tapped a Vatican representative to Vietnam. The nomination of 58-year-old Italian Archbishop Leopoldo Girelli is a pivotal step in the establishment of diplomatic relations even though Girelli will be a non-resident attaché to Vietnam. Archbishop Girelli will also be nuncio to Singapore and apostolic delegate to Malaysia and Brunei. Relations with the Vatican and Vietnam fizzled 36 years ago in 1975 after the communist regime expelled all the papal representatives from the war-torn nation. The Vietnam government wants to intervene in the naming of bishops of the country and the ordination of priests. In December 2009, the president of Vietnam visited the Vatican. It was the first visit by a Vietnamese leader and an event that the Vatican said was a step towards significant progress in bilateral relations. Vietnam has the fourth largest number of Catholics in Asia with six million Catholics. They constitute nearly 7% of the nation's total population. Well, from Pakistan, around 1,000 Muslims took to the streets today to protest Pope Benedict's urging of the nation to overturn its blasphemy laws. The protest took place outside the home of the man who confessed to killing a Pakistani governor who also favored overturning those laws. Protesters held signs with one sign calling the Pope's statement, quote, an attack on the heart of Muslims. The laws have gained much attention recently after a Christian woman was sentenced to die after being found guilty of blasphemy. That woman, Asiya Bibi, remains on death row. 
Well, back in New York, Park 51, the organization behind the proposed Islamic Center near Ground Zero, has named a new imam for the project. That new imam will help lead religious programming. Meanwhile, Faisal Abdul Raouf, the man, the imam who has been the public face of that center, he'll continue to serve on its board. Arizona continues to mourn the victims of the tragic shooting this past weekend in Tucson. A day after mourning the death of nine-year-old victim Christina Green, friends and family gathered today at the same Tucson church for the funeral of U.S. District Judge John Roll. Roll was a member of the Knights of Columbus who reportedly attended mass daily. Among those gathered at the funeral, Arizona Governor Jan Brewer, Senators John McCain and John Kyle, and former Vice President Dan Quayle. Meanwhile, Congress, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, who was severely wounded in that shooting, continues to make progress. A doctor says she's able to open her eyes more frequently. More than 50 religious leaders have sent, letter, uh, sent a letter to members of Congress calling for national soul-searching following that Arizona shooting. The letter, which was also published in the Capitol Hill newspaper Roll Call, was signed by Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and Muslim leaders who all called for civil discourse. Meanwhile, a new survey shows that many Americans saw a lack of civility in politics even before the shooting. According to the survey from the Public Religion Research Institute and the Religion News Service, almost half of Americans said the lack of civility was a serious problem. From Boston, after a case last year in which a homosexual couple was not allowed to enroll its child in Catholic school, the Archdiocese of Boston has created a new admissions policy. The policy states that schools must not discriminate or exclude any categories of students. Now, at the same time, the policy does allow pastors, principals, and other officials to develop their own admission standards for their schools. And finally, from Wisconsin, a teacher was poking around an old safe in her school and discovered a Bible that was over 300 years old. The Bible, which was printed in 1670, is Martin Luther's translation of the book. Officials say the Bible is in relatively good shape. No one at the school knows how the Bible wound up in the school's safe. Well, stay tuned. There's much more currents ahead when we return a memorial for earthquake victims at St. Patrick's Cathedral. But first, more thoughts from Haitian Americans in Brooklyn one year later. Non, nous pas dire le monde oublier Haïti si nous t'a dit ça nous t'a pas ingrat et c'est comme si nous t'ai gagné dit bon Dieu oublier Haïti. Nous pas dire ça parce que nous t'ai ouais que problème haïtien c'était problème toute nation. The task at hand is just so monumental that you know, it just it's just not something that can be completed in a year. J'ai écouté souvent la radio, nous t'ai des monde dit il y a un pile problème que pas fait une aide après les grands goût, il y a tout problème ça yo. Pendant les fait passer, tout le monde était sur émotion, tu voulais aider, mais après un an, au sens que la tension a descendu, que, que Haïti a mis en côté, on est en coin, mais tu n'as pas vraiment oublié, je ne vais pas oublier. Vous savez, know, ils sont toujours aidés, même si parfois ils finissent dans les mains de la main, mais ils sont toujours en train de faire leur mieux pour les aider. Welcome back to the special edition of Currents as we look back at Haiti one year after the earthquake. Well, among the numerous memorials that took place, Haitian Americans in New York gathered at Manhattan's St. Patrick's Cathedral, where Brooklyn Auxiliary Bishop Guy Sansarik, the first Haitian American bishop, celebrated a mass to remember the victims and to pray for their country. As you might well imagine, emotions ran high, running the gamut from hope to hurt. Today is essentially a day of prayer. We want to pray in the first place for the 350,000 people who instantly lost their lives. I have a lot of family die. My friend died. Two kids. Every Asian have somebody affected by this uh, catastrophe. The situation in Haiti is very, very sad. Sometimes when you look at it in the television, you want to cry, you know. I keep praying every day for those people. We believe in the power of prayer. Remember what St. James says, that the prayer of the faithful is powerful. So we believe in prayer, and we believe that through faith, hearts will be changed, and the ones hearts are changed, circumstances will also improve. We pray that the nation of Haiti will recover and courageously undertake 
the task of reconstructions. One year after the earthquake, the situation is unacceptable. All of us from the Haitian community, I believe that all of us, human beings, we are not satisfied to see the slow pace of the progress in Haiti. This is really no good. Uh, it's one year already. We don't have no progress. No progress. It really makes me angry. I'm not saying that I'm happy, I'm not happy, but uh, I think uh, uh, we really need a little more time just to get things together. In spite of all the assistance that was provided to Haiti, uh, the progress is very, very slow. You must realize the magnitude of the devastation. Therefore, even experts tell you that it will take 10, five to 10 years to recover. But I think 2011 will, uh, uh, will help us to see more visible signs of progress. We encourage all Haitians and all the friends of Haiti to continue to work very hard. And sometimes we have to really work on the foundation of Haiti and work for the development of basic virtues such as courage, love, forgiveness. We need to create a new Haiti. Definitely some heartfelt words there from Bishop Sanserique and those gathered at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Wednesday. When we come back, we bring it back to Brooklyn. In fact, the very heart of one of Brooklyn's Haitian communities. But first, more thoughts from Haitians in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Moi crois que bon Dieu gagne un plan pour nous et pour plan ça a passé. Moi crois que c'est en pile conversion qui pour faire pour reconstruire Haïti à tous les points de vue et dans tous les domaines. C'est ça que je souhaitais pour l'an 2000-2011. Le peuple en fait en fait tout mon a mouru. But nous t'arrêmes, mais c'est pas ça nous t'arrêmes. Nous t'arrêmes, mon Dieu, nous bagaille plus ou moins si on gagne aide vraiment pour y ouvrir, pour y aider peuple là, c'est ça nous besoin. Et ça nous même à New York que nous t'arrêmes que aider peuple là. Je crois que si on sentit que haïtien, nous mettons nous ensemble main dans la main parce que Davis Bay a c'est d'unité fait la force. Avec unité, nous capable de résoudre, nous capable d'aller loin. Et Haïti a retourné à Haïti peut-être. Je pense qu'il va retourner à Haïti que bien longtemps. Well, we started tonight in Brooklyn, and that is where we end. The earthquake that hit Haiti a year ago hit home for Haitians around the world, including right here in Brooklyn. On Wednesday night, bishops, priests, and dignitaries gathered at St. Jerome's Parish in East Flatbush, that's one of the borough's vibrant Haitian communities, to observe and reflect on the one-year anniversary of the Haiti earthquake. It's been a year since the terrible earthquake in Haiti. And tonight we come together and we did something very significant and important. There's almost 25 parishes where we celebrate a mass in front of the Haitian people. So everyone's doing their own, but tonight this is kind of the central one. Bishop St. Sarik will preach, I will uh, say the mass. I think it's important that we show our solidarity and I, I think it does help people to see that they're not forgotten. St. Jerome is the only parish in the whole country that has a mass in Creole every single day. St. Jerome is like at the center of the life of Haitian people. It's because maybe we are on East Flatbush, uh, where we have a, a large concentration of Haitian. It's a very emotional moment. At the same time, we have to call the people to hope, and not an illusory dream, but to get involved into the reconstruction of the devastated nation. To see Bishop DiMarzio, Commissioner Kelly, Senator Parker, to all come in in unison for one cause, it was great because I was a part of, of something that was so big in the church. It's not more of sadness, it's more of hope. It kind of shows what people are made of. The Bishop DiMarzio being here was great. You should, you've seen the support that he was showing towards our community, and we felt that we need to be more together. We need to get together to work on what we have to work on to rebuild our country the way it should be.
Oui, justement, c'est plus bel moment, plus grande joie dans la vie, moi. Que je suis passé parce que je dis, on a fait un an exactement en bataille. De toute façon, je pense que ça va prendre encore du temps. Parce que jusqu'à date, nous sommes un pays sous-développé. Il faut que nous reconnaissions ça, mais il y a espoir quand même. Il y a amélioré. Les candles symbolisent les souls de nos frères et sœurs. Il y a tellement de candles dans la church comme une prière pour Jésus pour laisser sa lumière shine sur eux, pour les prendre, pour montrer le chemin à la vie. Eternal life. It is a, uh, is a symbol, is a symbol of, of freedom. We, we came from slavery to, to freedom. At any situation we, we find ourselves in, we always know that there is somebody with us. It is God. It is God is at, is at our side. So we, we mourn the death of, of our people, but we know that we're not alone. Very moving remembrance there. Well, that's it for this edition of Currents. Coming up on Monday, it's another look back, this time at the year that was 2010. Until then, be sure to check us out online over at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night and a great weekend.